Hello and welcome to another episode of Darwin Investors. Got a down, another down day in the market today. Um, but we're going to go ahead and talk about some things that we can do to, to get through this. At the end of this, I'll show you what I'm doing in my portfolio that actually I'm actually making money today and I'll show you how I'm doing it. Um, we're going to talk about the, the war in Ukraine just really briefly. Um, there's a lot of fear in the market about, say, a nuclear war. And I'm going to give you my take on that. We'll look over the CPI data that just was released this morning. So we'll have an inflation read. What was expected? What came out? And what we can expect possibly the market to react from that? And like I said, at the very end, I'll, I'll show you. I'll let you into my portfolio. I'll show you what I'm doing that makes it so that I can make money in times like this. So let's go ahead. I'll share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. So this was an article that I, that I read that I really liked that I can no longer read because I have not subscribed to USA Today, but I did read it and I can tell you what it said. And what it was was an interview with this uh, Colonel Yevgeny Vinman. Colonel Yevgeny Vinman, uh, he got a master's or no, he got a degree. I don't know if it was a master's, but uh, from Harvard in Ukraine Russian studies. He joined the army. He retired from the United States Army after 20 years. He was a member of several presidential um, cabinets as an advisor to Ukraine and Russia, and um, he shares his opinion on the on Russia and their current uh, their current state of things. He's of the opinion that that uh, Putin would, in all likelihood, not fire nuclear weapons. I'd certainly agree with him. Um, he's uh, he, he talks about how the 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 army went into Ukraine, did not know they were even going to, to um, fight a war. They thought they were going for humanitarian reasons. They thought they were going for a training exercise. They were very surprised by this. Uh, many of uh, Putin's associates were surprised by the war. His own FSB, which is the new version of the KGB, was surprised by the war. Um, and this is very much Putin's war. And I know there's a lot of accusations out there that China might have known about this war ahead of time, but I guess I'm not sure how China was supposed to know if uh, the people in the invading force didn't know and a lot of people close to Putin didn't know. So I don't think that China was in the know. The only people that seemed to be in the know was the Western um, power uh, political elite, if you will, uh, Joe Biden and uh, Boris Johnson and the like, they, they all seem to, to uh, be sounding the alarm on this war. And of course, they were ridiculed for this about a week prior to the invasion, and they turned out to be correct. And they seem to be about the only people that knew anything about this war. So you've got this FSB here. And um, FSB, like I said, is the new Russian KGB. And they have this, now this paper they believe came from that. They said it could be some sort um, th that it seemed authentic, while others cautioned that it could be part of anti-Russian propaganda. But we don't really know, but it, it does seem authentic. But what we're saying is that what this article is saying is that this FSB whistleblower um, is just concerned about this invasion in Ukraine, how it's gone horribly wrong, and he's concerned about the number of generals that are being killed. We do know that Russia has fired about eight of their generals for failing to complete tasks, and Putin is not happy about his FSB failures. We do know this. We see Putin sitting at this table. You could, this is, I think, very interesting. You see how far he sits away from anybody else. Why would he be sitting this far away from people? Well, a lot of it could have something to do with this. You got this assassination of Kim Jong-nam, and this is a half-brother or whatever it was, the half-brother of Kim Jong-un was assassinated in an airport by two women who simply touched him. Um, they touched him and assassinated him at an airport. So perhaps he's afraid someone might touch him and assassinate him. So that tells you the, mind, the, the mindset of Vladimir Putin at this time. But what does that mean to me? Well, this means that this is a guy right here that doesn't want to die. And a nuclear uh, holocaust is certain to kill him. And this is a guy right here that wants to rule the world. But if the world is, doesn't exist, what is he supposed to rule? So this to me tells me that, it, that I never want to say that nuclear war is completely off the table or that he wouldn't do it or certainly fire small tactical nuclear weapons into a thing, into some area. But it seems to me that he would, he's not, he doesn't want to die. 
That's, that's what this tells me. Secondly, like I said, this is Putin's war and this is, and, and to fire weapons, he doesn't have like little buttons all over his desk. Oh, this is Siberia to Alaska. This one is um, Siberia to uh, Los Angeles. He doesn't have these buttons all over his desk to do this. He's actually got to do this with the help of other people. So he has to make a call or hit a button and send somebody else has to hit a button and then someone else has to hit a button and they all have to like get together and, and, and hit all these buttons together to get one to fire off if it's going to fire at all. And a lot of these people aren't in favor of this war. So he's very isolated and he's going to have, I think, an army of the unwilling to, to start a nuclear disaster. That's, that's, that's my take. Um, on actually firing the missile. Secondly, he's got a very large nuclear arsenal. Everybody talks about this large nuclear arsenal of like 6,000 missiles or what have you, but they're not all ready to go right now. I mean, some will have, probably have to be loaded and then and put into place and then fired, you know. That being said, I guess they did uh, drop bombs on a nuclear uh, facility in, in Ukraine. I wanna say one for sure, maybe more than one, but one for sure. So maybe they are willing to, to, to do some nuclear damage. Um, but that's my take is that, is that Vladimir Putin doesn't really want to die. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about switching gears big time. We'll talk about, uh, the consumer inflation data that came out today and what was expected. Well, what was expected was e economists expected it to go to 7.8%. Um, CPI was ex is expected to peak next month as they as we factor in the higher gasoline prices. However, this guy down here, this Stanley, he says gasoline prices moved somewhat higher in the last days of February, enough to nudge my headline CPI forecast up by a tenth to zero point eight percent. But the bulk of the pain will be felt in March and April, says Stephen Stanley, chief economist at Amherst. Stanley forecast February's headline CPI will be up by 7.9% year over year. He expects March's CPI will at least be a percentage point higher, just under 9%. Also, they expected that uh, in, this, in this report, Excluding food and energy, the core CPI will be up 0.5%, that's below January 0.6%, to have a core inflation of 6.4% year over year. So let's have a look and see what happened. So um, again, this is the, the, the transcript that just came out this morning from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. And it turned out that the consumer price index did in fact rate, uh, go up 0.8%. Um, we also found that, uh, that the all index index rose to 7.9%, just as predicted for 12 months, at least by Stanley, uh, for the, for 12 months ending February and that the all items, less food and energy rose, rose to 6.4% exactly as predicted by not just Stanley, but it looked like just kind of in general. So this is this is what they were expecting. So it seemed like this is kind of in line with what people were expecting. On all items, uh, January to February, stuff went up about 0.2%. Food was on the rise. Food at home was getting more expensive. I think we noticed that we go to the grocery stores, things are more expensive than they used to be. But things are somehow on this list a little bit less, exp uh, less expensive than they used to be. And I'm not understanding how, but we're just gonna say that energy, according to this, is down to 3.5% in the month of March versus 0.9% in, uh, in the month of January. Gasoline prices, of course, is way up. We expect that next, next month this is going to be way, way up. Fuel and oil is going to be way, way up. Um, this is, I think, very interesting. So energy services and electricity actually came down. So our electricity bills supposedly were down in February versus January. Now, I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying that and, and, and don't bomb me in the comments, I'm just reading the, what it says right here, is that this was actually negative. And so some things went down, like energy, electricity, energy services, and some things went up, food at home and that. So we look at uh, vehicles, I don't know that that's very important. If you don't wanna buy a car, don't buy one. Um, all items, less food and energy was down on a month to month basis from 0.5 or from 0.6 to 0.5. Used cars and trucks were down. 
apparel was down. Um, I guess a little com competition for, 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 for clothing. Commodities, medical care commodities were down. Um, you know, uh, shelter. So that's finally moving up a little bit here. Um, that's probably going to move up a little bit more going forward. And medical care seems to be moving down. So, so nothing in here um, make me think that um, that that the that the market was going to crash as a result of this particular report. Now, and as we said, they're expecting it to be um, a, almost nine percent. Excuse me, um, almost nine percent next month. And so I don't know what will scare us from this. Um, I do know that this means that the Fed will continue with their rate hikes. I do believe that we'll go up that 0.25%, um, but we're not going to go up 0.5%. And that's as a result of this war in Ukraine. Now, maybe this is a downside of having waited so long to do interest rate hikes. Um, because uh, if we had just done it a while ago, we would we would be ahead of the curve right now. But now we waited, and by waiting, now something has happened on the world stage, where we where we're not going to be as aggressive as we maybe should in curbing inflation. And the reason why I think we should be able to curb inflation more now than we did say at other times, and that's because of our unemployment rates, only 3.8%. If you look at other times when inflation is spun out of control, our unemployment rate was also really high. But this economy seems seems like it could take it right now. And I and just um, looking at this here, I just wanted to go into a little bit about the energy and to see how that went down, because I was really confused. Um, that the energy index was 3.5% in February, following a, a 0.9 increase in January. Uh, the gasoline index was sharply in February, increasing 6.6% after falling 0.8% in January. Uh, the index for natural gas increased in February, rising 1.5% after declining 0.5% in January. In contrast, the electricity index, which rose sharply in January, declined 1.1% in February. So they don't really go into why this happened or how they got these numbers. Um, they're just saying that it declined. Um, and I show this because I was interested in seeing how this happened, see if they would elaborate on it, but they don't really do that. So at the, the fear greed index, you can see that we are in a period of extreme fear. The fear greed index is a CNN business uh, gauge that looks over different things like junk bond demand, market volatility, stock price strength, and the like. That determine that right now we are in a period of extreme fear. And, and I can understand that, you know, um, you can see here from our inflation, our inflation has spiked to about as high as it's ever been since like 1980s. And so that's alarming. Um, you can see though that, that our unemployment rate in 1982 was about nearly 11% unemployment rate. We're currently sitting at, at uh, 3.8. But when I look at stuff like this, and and it was hard for me to get my head around why people would be so, honestly, as strange as it seems, so fearful right now. And the reason why I don't understand it is because it's kind of the opposite of the way I think. So when I when I look at something like Microsoft here, and I see that it's sitting here at two hundred and eighty five dollars or whatever it is right now, as opposed to say three hundred and forty one dollars back in December, it's down set over seventeen percent. Uh, from just in just like the last few months to me it's far more risky to invest up here than it is to invest down here so i i guess i don't understand a ton of fears is, is if you're investing something like microsoft why is it why is it scarier to invest at 285 than it is to invest at 341 i don't really know that answer but then i, I talked to a friend of mine and he said well a lot of people don't invest the way i do you know they're they're essentially people that um that they're using this money you know this isn't money that they're having fun with this isn't money that they're they're um uh, that they're locking away in some account in microsoft that they know will eventually bounce back someday this is money they expect to use and maybe in the next few months maybe they're having a baby maybe they need to pay their bills maybe they're going to have a car payment these are this is money they need in the short term though they know they're they're not under the the delusion that it's not better to invest now than it was 
then, but they thought when they invested then it would go up and they would have this money in a couple of months. And they, they think now when they invest, they're going to be down 50%, you know, like the next uh, couple of months. And then that's not a position they want to be in when they need to pay their bills is to, is to do that. So they're, they're quickly getting in and out. So then I say to them, I say, well, what about like the banks, you know, the banks, you think that why are they moving all their money out of there? Because they're the ones really moving this market. Well, I think it's because a bank really moves um, kind of like my friend who's kind of in and out of the market and that sort of thing. A bank doesn't invest by and large in 2022 so that they can have more money in 2026 for retirement or whatever. Uh, they're, they're not doing that. Um, they're basically trying to get in and out and make little gains. Now, the way my portfolio works is, is very close to what a bank would do um, in that, I, or at least a, a, a hedge fund might work this way as well. A hedge fund would have stocks that they, that they keep for long term, but they're making money in the short run. And I'm going to get into it and I'll show you how I'm doing this. Um, I, we'll get into my portfolio and I'll show you in real time how I'm doing this and, and maybe I'll execute a trade or two, depending on how things look. Uh, to show people how I'm doing this. Uh, S&P right here is sitting at what, 42.50. Um, again, if you're gonna buy the SPY, to me it's a whole lot less risky to buy the SPY down here at 42.50 than it was uh, up here at 47, almost 4,800. If This looks less risky to me. A lot of these people, when they say buying the SPY, you're gonna hear over and over and over again, SPY 4,200, SPY 4,200. Well, you know, S&P 4200, they think that, oh, that's a bottom. They think that's a bottom because if you look over here at Yardini Research, S&P large caps at 18, right? That, that, that looks like to them a reasonable, a reasonable level for S&P 500 on a forward uh, price to earnings uh, basis. But, you know, stocks don't all fall at the same exact rate, you know, certain stocks, um, you know, they've, they've, they've been in a bear market for a year now, some stocks for a couple of months. Most stocks in the S&P have already fallen well below uh, 20%. Microsoft is one of those they said hasn't been affected yet, but we clearly saw just now that it has. Um, so th these, the S&P is like, it's, it is only down like 12%, but really the most of it is is in in bear market territory and some would even say a crash some of these stocks some stocks are actually really up today so i would say that that right now if you look at something like crowdstrike holdings it's up 23 dollars today today this is not the kind of market you, where you want to go chasing this this is the kind of market where if you own crowdstrike today you might consider selling it Right. And then and then going back into cash and then coming back into something else at another time. If you're underweight or underwater, excuse me, on CrowdStrike right now, let's say you bought it and your your strike price was 214 and you don't feel like and you have 100 shares, you don't feel like losing two thousand dollars. Maybe you sell a covered call on this holding. This is not the day to buy CrowdStrike. This is the day to sell CrowdStrike. If you look at something like Amazon here, Amazon is up $140 because they announced a 20 for one split. I'll be doing another video on that and my take on that uh, soon, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Let's just say that, that, that it's done a 20 for one split. It's up $172 a share. This is not the day to buy Amazon. This is the day that if you're down on Amazon to actually just sell Amazon and wait for it to come back to you. And so this is this the type of market that we're in, or at least that's the way that that I'm playing it. This is a market that's uh, very highly volatile. And I'm going to show you how you can use this volatility to your advantage. The volatility index, also called the VIX, is sitting at 31.5. Anything over 30 is very high. You can see it rarely gets there. Let's look uh, since since 2000, at least what is this? 2004. It's only been 30. Just what one, two, three, four five, six, seven times in seven times in 15 years. So this is very high volatility at the moment. I'm going to show you how you can, um, how you can benefit from that. And the way that you benefit from that is like this. So you'd benefit by your options and here's my options account. And like I said, 
I'm not exactly uh, losing money at the moment. Today, I've, I'm up $334.41 on my options in a bad market day. Well, how'd I do that? Well, one thing that I did was I sold a put on CrowdStrike that expires tomorrow. It was a 135 strike put, meaning if CrowdStrike finishes below $135, by tomorrow, then that means I would have to buy 100 shares of CrowdStrike at that price or buy my way out of that contract. So it's very, it's less risky way of trying to buy shares. And this is what the big banks are doing. So they are making money, one, by buying puts, obviously, which is making money if the market goes down. They're making money by selling puts, just as I did here. I bought it back for $2. I sold it for $159. So, um, so this is one way they're making money. I have another put that I have uh, right here that I'm selling. DocuSign reports earnings right after the close today. DocuSign, I'm saying that if DocuSign falls below $75 on earnings, then I will go ahead and buy 100 shares of DocuSign for $75. Bucks. I'm already up on this position 56%. If I was up 75%, I would just close it out right now, not worry about it. Someone paid me $205. To, to sell this put. I sold this put a couple of days ago. Right now, the, that, that sold put is only worth $89. And so, and so what that means is that if it finishes below $75 on the 11th of March, I would have to buy 100 shares of DocuSign. DocuSign right now is currently trading for... Um, for $94.19. So it would have to fall almost 20 bucks today after earnings for me to lose that money. Why am I bullish on DocuSign? Well, you can go over here to, to DocuSign's investor relations, click on their SEC filings, click on their 10Q, and I look at this 10Q, and I see here in, in DocuSign, I see a company that's growing at a rapid rate, right? Uh, nine months ended October 31st, 971 million. Now it's 1.4 billion, one, nine, you know, one year later. That's quite a bit of growth. We would say that's about, what, 50% growth in one year. I see a company that um, I don't see people um, signing things by hand ever again. Like in five years, you'll never, you'll never sign anything by hand. I went and I bought a car at CarMax. I'm sitting right there in, in, their, in their office buying a car. Do you think I signed anything by hand? No, they turned, they said, uh, here, get on the computer and here's your mouse and start clicking away. I was signing using DocuSign. So I see that the, the e-signing of documents is going to be something that's just going to be like everyday life. We're, we'll never sign anything again. It's all going to be through this. It's going to be automated. When I also look at DocuSign, I also see this, and this is the biggest thing. This is the net loss. Now this company is not yet profitable. It's the reason why it went from like $280 down to like 95 bucks. Cause the, the market right now does not like unprofitable companies. So in 2020, they lost 92 cents a share. Through nine months, 2021, they lost 20 cents a share. Three months ended October, 2020, they lost 31 cents a share. And three months ended October 31st, 2021, they lost three cents a share. So they went from losing 31 cents a share to three cents a share. What I'm thinking, and this is my bullish thesis, is that DocuSign, for the very first time ever, today after, after the bell, after the, after the market closes, could possibly turn in their very first ever net profit. And that's going to send that stock straight up in the sky. And so for that reason, um, I'm going to hold on to DocuSign.
Now, also, they don't have a very high bar to get over. You know, they're, they're, they're a company that if they lose money, it's like, okay, it's DocuSign, lost money. And if it goes down 20 bucks, I'll buy it because I think that they will eventually be profitable pretty soon. And I believe in their business model. I don't believe we're ever going to go back to wet signing stuff again. And so I'll hold on to it. But for that, I'm bullish on DocuSign. The rest I've done here is I've sold covered calls. And so let's go ahead and look at one that I might just go ahead and cash out on right now. Let me see here. Do I have any that are up 70%? I like to at least cash out when they're 70% up. I have none that are up 70%. You can see I made 43% on NVIDIA today. Um, I'm up 70% on, on AMD today. But here I'm only up 65%. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to let this one ride a little bit. I don't feel like paying that because I don't think they're going to get there and I don't care if they do. But what I'm saying is that um, here, let's look at AMD. You know what the hell? I'll go ahead and do it. Um, so AMD is, is I, I, I sold a covered call. What that says is I will sell to, to the buyer 100 shares of AMD for $120 a share if it finishes above that on March 18th. And so, so what I'm saying is I believe that AMD will be below $120 on March 18th. Someone paid me $96.35 to make that deal. So someone bought a call for $96.35 for AMD that with a with a strike price of $120 and a an expiration date of March 18th or next Friday. And so I'm saying that I believe it'll stay under $120. So I'm um, hoping that AMD doesn't go up too high. So it's a stock I own. I own this stock, but I'm kind of rooting against my own stock. Totally against it. I don't want it to fall through the floor, but I don't want it to go over $120 either, you know? And so that's that's the funny thing about this. And this is, I think, kind of like the way the banks are reacting right now. They they wouldn't mind their stocks going up. They don't want them to go up too much, you know? And they'll they'll find a way to drive the price below the because they have the power if they want to with some of these stocks. Certainly a smaller one like this Revolve, if they own most of the shares, they can they can make this price whatever they feel like it. So if AMD starts going way high and like to say it's $127 and they don't want to sell all their shares for 120, they'll just, they'll tank it so that they don't have to do that or at least get it close to that so that they can make some money. I don't have the power to do that. And so, um, and so that's one way that these, these banks can make money. I've also sold a covered call on Lowe's. I need it to stay below $240. By the 18th of March, I'm currently up on that one, 60%. I have Toll Brothers. I should do a video on this stock. Their last quarter was absolutely fantastic. I am so bullish on this company, it's not even funny. They sell for about, I wanna say 51 bucks a share right now, maybe $50 a share. I haven't looked at the market really that much today, if I'm honest. Um, and uh, and they, they sell for about $50 a share. And this is a company that uh, sells high-end homes. That, that's what they're, they're a high-end home builder. I, I doubt the people that are buying million-dollar homes uh, care that much about paying another dollar at the, at the pump for gas. And I'm sorry, but that's the truth for, for certain people. Um, they have a lot of homes like in the pipeline that, that are already like kind of like sold. Um, this, company's, uh, this company has got a really bright future ahead of it. Their, their earnings are going up and that it's a very inexpensive stock, A rated by Charles Schwab. And of course there's Nvidia, which I love. And so I'm, I'm up a bunch on it today on this, on, this, on this covered call. It looks like overall I'm still down $22 on it. I like to sell these when I'm up about 70%. So just for the sake of this video, I'll go ahead and buy this AMD covered call back. What is it? $34 for it? All right, fine. Yeah, so I've sold the AMD covered call for $32. And I locked in the, whatever that was, $70 or so in gains. And why would I do that? Well, the, the termination date was, and why would I sell it at 70% like now? Well, the termination date was the 18th of March. One reason is for this video. I wouldn't have really done it. I like to get, at least get up 70%, but, but the other reason is that, that this thing expires on the 18th of March. It's currently only the 10th of March. 
So I expect that sometime between now and the 18th of March, we will have an up day for AMD. On that up day, I will sell another covered call. So that's how you use these updates. You don't use it to buy more shares. You buy shares on the down days, but on the up days, I'm selling covered calls. That's how I'm up on almost all of these things, is that when the market goes up, I sell a covered call. And so that's how I'm playing this market. I could and probably should uh, sell more or buy more of these back. But the thing is, I, I'm pretty sure tomorrow will be awful as well. So I'm just kind of like waiting. And I like to get up my 70% uh, before I do this. And DocuSign, I probably should just buy back right now and not worry about it. But I'm going to throw the dice and we'll see what happens. I'm right now up 50%. I could just buy it back, make $102 and not worry about it. But it could go down another $20 a day. And tomorrow when I make more videos or whatever, I'll own 100 shares of DocuSign. But then I'll sell a cover call on those. So that is how I'm playing the market right now. So basically I'm not buying on green days. I'm buying on red days. I'm selling covered calls on green days. I'm making little bits of money at a time. I wait for more green days to sell more covered calls. And that's what I'm doing. So that was my take on the war in Ukraine, CPI data, and what I'm doing to, to make money in this market. If you got anything out of this video, make sure to go ahead and like, subscribe, hit that little notification bell. Uh, and then I'll let you know how I did on my, <laughs> on my DocuSign uh, sold put. Until then, we'll see you later. Bye.